more people so uh, welcome to this presentation about creating stereoscopic animations my name is Bartek Skorupa and I would like to give you just a quick introduction to the world of stereoscopy show you the workflow that I use and maybe give you some tips on how to create our scenes such that they become a bit uh, more uh, stereo friendly um, <clears throat> I had a chance to work on about 20 stereoscopic animations so far, and this of course doesn't make me the most experienced stereographer in the world. However, I think that I managed to uh, learn a thing or two. For me, it all started back a few years ago when one of my clients asked me to create some stereoscopic version of some of the animations, and back then I knew nothing about stereoscopy except the obvious things like that we need to have two cameras in our scene. So uh, the way of my thinking back then was pretty similar, I think, to the way of thinking of many beginners. So I began to coming up with several brilliant ideas, like, uh, for example, we should place the cameras such that the distance between them is exactly 65 millimeters, because this is the average distance between the human eyes. Brilliant idea, however wrong. Another brilliant idea was that I should always use 50 millimeters lens because this is the most natural and it's the safest. The 50 millimeters uh, lens uh, reflects the best the way that we see the world normally. Wrong again. And uh, of course we should toll the cameras in, we should converge them because when we are looking at some object we're doing it with our eyes. So we should definitely do it wrong again. So why all those ideas are wrong? The cameras that we are using in stereo are not our eyes. They simply capture the images and then everything is created in our head but the link between the cameras and our eyes is not that simple. Okay, so I will of course tell you uh, what should the distance between the cameras be, what focal length should we use and why shouldn't we tell the cameras in but 
uh, first let's uh, start with introducing some uh, basic terms in uh, stereoscopy. And the first one is parallax. We are using two cameras. So the representation of the same object, uh, left representation of the same object is a little bit shifted uh, in relation to the right representation of the same object. And this shift is called parallax. We can have positive parallax, which means that the left representation is to the left from the right representation. So in order to fuse those two images together, we have to converge our eyes behind the screen, and this is where the object will appear. When we have the negative parallax, the left representation is to the right from the right representation, and the object will appear in front of the screen. What's the relation between the parallax and the distance? If we set the negative parallax exactly to the distance between the viewer's eyes, then the object will appear exactly halfway between the viewer and the screen. When the positive parallax is set this way, so the distance uh, between the left and right representation is exactly the same as the distance between the viewer's eyes, he will look in infinity. The object will appear in infinity. So, there are two issues. First is that everything is dependent on the distance between the viewer and the screen, and the second one is that this relation between the parallax and the perceived distance is not linear. However, it's not that much important, because what is more important is the feeling of the depth. And this feeling about the depth comes not only from the parallax, but we are also given several other cues, like the perspective lines, and we easily interpret the perspective lines as the information about the depth we see something like this, and here we have the occlusion. The further objects are occluded by the closer ones, and we also judge the depth based on this information. Here we also have the occlusion, but also something else that is called aerial perspective. So the objects, of course, change colors depending on the distance. Focus. Right here we are focusing on this bird, and everything is out of focus, and this also helps us judge the depth, the distances. When we are moving, for example, we move the camera, so we have something that is called motion parallax. So the closer objects move faster and the further moves a little bit slower. Uh, our depth perception is a funny thing, and sometimes we can uh, get uh, pretty interesting results, like this one, for example. So this was shot intentionally this way, or this one, or this one, or this one. Those, those images were shot this way intentionally, but I don't think that the next one was shot this way intentionally. However, it's interesting, right? So depth perception is a funny thing. Let's go back to our stereoscopy. Uh, what happens if we set the parallax of some, objects, uh, of some object to be too big? If we set the negative parallax big negative parallax, take a look at the eyes of this guy. It doesn't look very healthy, he has to converge his eyes dramatically. So we should keep the negative parallax in some reasonable limits. Uh, and uh, this is not much of a problem. The greater problem appears when we set the positive parallax too big. When the positive parallax is greater than the distance between the viewer's eyes, this is what happens. The viewer has to diverge his eyes. It's as if he is looking beyond infinity. And this is very unnatural. We, in real world, when we are looking at anything, we never have to diverge our eyes. However, it doesn't mean that we cannot do it. We can. But of course, not that strong. We can do it something like this, maybe. And it's been tested that the divergence of about one degree is acceptable. And I will, of course, tell you how to set everything such that we never exceed this value. Now, first let me tell you a few words about the screen size factor. Screen size in stereoscopy matters much. It has a great influence on, on, on our perception. So let's imagine that we are creating 2K image, which is 2048 pixels of width, and we set the parallax of some objects to 20 pixels. So it gives us about 1% of the screen width. If we show this image on the screen that is one meter wide, this parallax will be 10 millimeters, right? 10 meters wide screen, so a small cinema screen, and the parallax is 100 millimeters. If we remember that the distance between the human eyes is about 65 millimeters, now we have exceeded this value. 
And if we show it on in IMAX, 25 meters wide screen, 250 millimeters, so it's huge parallax. And we begin to have a big problem of divergence. However, it will be limited because we will never watch the movie on such a huge screen from such a short distance. We will sit further. So the divergence will come back to some reasonable uh, values. And it's been tested that the positive parallax of 12 pixels will never cause any problems, uh, no matter what the screen size is. We will never, uh, we will never get uncomfortable divergence. Even 31 pixels of parallax is not that much problematic, at least for most of the seats in the cinema. So, for example, if I don't care about you guys and you guys, I could use even such a big parallax. You would have problems, but you back there would uh, comfortably uh, be able to watch it. So. When I am setting stereoscopy uh, for uh, setting the maximum positive parallax for cinema and I'm creating uh, like 2K uh, image, those are my limits. I tend to use the maximum of 13, maybe 15 pixels sometimes. Okay, three very important terms in stereoscopy, depth budget, depth bracket, and depth position. Depth budget is the maximum, is allowed, allowed depth range. This is the range that we can play with. And uh, if we say that the negative parallax shouldn't exceed 15 pixels and the positive parallax shouldn't exceed 13 pixels, this is our depth budget. It gives us a total of 28 pixels. Now, so this is the amount of depth that, that we can use. Depth bracket is the amount of depth that we are using, in fact. So it's a <coughs> difference between the parallax of the furthest point in the scene and the parallax of the nearest point in the scene, FPP, far point parallax, NPP, near point parallax. So this, of course, must fit into the depth budget. And it's reasonable not to use all of the depth budget that we have to our disposal, but to keep it, in, I tend to keep it in, 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 in this limit about uh, 14 uh, pixels. Now, the depth position. Once we set the depth budget, we, uh, the depth bracket, we have the depth that we are using, we can position it in space. We can very easily move all of our depth forth and backwards. And this is depth positioning. So our 14 pixels can fit into, for example, this range, or can fit into this range, can also fit into this range. However, when we are looking now at the depth budget that we have to our disposal, you see that the last range is not correct. We shouldn't position our depth this way. Now, let's concentrate on controlling the depth position. And there are two ways of controlling it. The first one is towing the cameras in. So, doing something like this. If we tow the cameras in exactly on the nearest point in our scene, the nearest object in our scene will appear on the screen and everything else will be behind the screen. When we tow in a little bit closer, then all of our depth will be moved backwards. If we tow in behind the nearest point uh, in, in our scene, some of the objects will, uh, will, will be pulled uh, in front of, of, of the screen. However, when we are towing in the cameras, we have the problem of keystoning. This is what happens. This is the left and right view of, of, the, of the grid, and as you can see, it doesn't look uh, very, very good, and it's uh, not that easy to work on such image. So towing in is not the best idea of uh, positioning our depth bracket. However, we have to somehow position it, because if we leave our cameras parallel, this is what happens. No matter how far the object in the scene is, it will always stay in front of the screen. You can see it. Here is our scene, and here is what the viewer sees. Okay? So we have to find some other way. And there is. Hmm? When uh, we have the parallel cameras, the object, no matter how far in the scene it is, it will always be visible for the viewer in front of the screen. Here is our viewer, here is the screen, and here is where the object appears. And this is our scene. We have two parallel cameras. And as you can see here, the object is close to the cameras. Now I move it further. And anyway, 
it is still in front of the screen for the viewer. It pops out. I move it a little bit further, and it still is in front of the screen. Even if it is like 100, 500 kilometers away, it will still be in front of the screen. This is what happens when we set the cameras to be parallel, right? 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 OK. OK. So uh, now, um, there, so, so, so we have to find a way to position our debt. And there, there is a, another way of positioning, positioning it. Uh, it's by shifting the images, the rendered images in post-production. So if we here have just uh, parallel cameras, we can, in post-production, just shift the images like this, and the objects move uh, further away. We shift more, and it moves further away. We shift even more, and it moves even further. So this is the proper way of uh, positioning our depth bracket. Now, very important uh, sentences. As you could see, the depth position can be changed in post-production. We can simply shift the images. However, if we change the depth position, it doesn't influence the depth bracket. If we set the depth bracket to 14 pixels, it will stay 14 pixels no matter where we position our depth. And depth bracket cannot be changed practically in post. So if you set something wrong and you have the depth bracket not correctly set, the only way to correct it is to re-render. So we would rather avoid this, and that's why we would like to be able to control our depth bracket. So here are all of the elements that influence the depth bracket. The depth bracket being the difference between the near point and far point parallax, um, so, of course, the distance to the near point and far point has the influence on the depth bracket, uh, as well as sensor size and focal length and stereo base. What is stereo base? It's the distance between the cameras. And this is the most important thing. This is something that we focus on when we are creating uh, our stereoscopic images. So, when we are setting stereo base, we have to take into account all of the other four uh, parameters. And here are some of the relations. If the near point distance is um, um, bigger, we can set the maximum uh, stereo base bigger, and so on. Here you see the relations. Of course, we would rather be able to calculate it uh, like uh, uh, precisely. So there must be some equations. And there are. There's something that is called John Berkowitz formula. There's something that is called Frank, uh, Frank Di Martio equation, something that is called Pierre Mondre formula, if I pronounce it uh, right. But come on, don't we have anything for humans? Yes, we do. There is something that is called 1 to 30 rule. And this rule says that the ratio between the stereo base, the distance between the cameras, and the distance to the nearest point in the scene should never exceed 1 to 30 ratio. However, as you can see, mo most of the parameters that are important are ignored when we are using this rule. So I used this rule only once in my life. It was the first animation that I was working on, and I never used it again because, uh, well, it simply, it simply didn't work, and I didn't have the full control over what I am doing. So maybe there is some smart trick. Um, I began to search, and uh, I didn't find anything that would suit my needs, so I began doing something like this myself, like this, and I even used the favorite application for every artist, which is Microsoft Excel, and I did a little bit of this, and then I came up with something like this. It's an add-on. Uh, I simply select, if I want to set up the scene, uh, I select the camera, uh, the, the main camera in my scene, um, launch the add-on, and uh, some objects are added, uh, especially the camera, the right camera. And the right camera is parented to the left camera. Its X position is driven by the driver, and this driver takes care about everything. So it, uh, it takes into account the positions of those two objects, of those two planes. I simply have to position those planes such that all of my scene is wrapped by, by, by them, like uh, the near 
plane is uh, positioned, uh, positioned at the nearest object in my scene and the far plane at the furthest object in my scene. So then the, then the, um, the driver that drives the exposition of my right camera will take care about everything. It will uh, calculate, uh, it will take into account the focal length, the sensor size, and also take some data from our scene, so, uh, which, is the, which is the resolution. And then uh, I have some custom properties uh, assigned to this right camera, and here I determine what I want. So I am preparing everything such that uh, I will, in post-production, I will shift the images, so I will definitely need to render a little bit wider images such that the, uh, then I can crop them. And here, uh, in the first row, I simply specify how many pixels will be cropped. So in this case, I render a 2,000 pixels uh, wide image, and I want it to be uh, 19, 20, so I crop 80 uh, pixels. And then the second, uh, the second row is the most important one. This is my desired depth bracket. If I set it like here to 15 pixels, it will set my scene that everything that is between the far point and near point will be distributed exactly into 15 pixels in this case. And there are also some, some, some other parameters. The last one, the multiplier, this is something that uh, gives uh, the artist some, some freedom because uh, it's not always that we want to set the maximum allowed stereo uh, base. Sometimes we want to make it a little bit smaller. So you can set it instead of one to, 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 to something, something else, 0 0.7. And, and then it will give us 70% of maximum allowed depth uh, of maximum allowed stereo base. Okay. Let me uh, now show you the real life uh, example. Oh. Not that easy. My fault. Um, I will show you now the commercial that we were working on uh, recently, and it's uh, it's just a 30 seconds uh, commercial. It was broadcasted in television, but also uh, we have created a stereoscopic version of it. I won't, of course, be able to show it uh, to you in stereo. However, well, I hope that it will work. It will. Witajcie na kosmicznej misji! Chodźcie! Chodźcie! A co to? Magiczny grzyb! Kompas zwariował! Patrzcie, jest ich tam więcej! Przed nami mnóstwo badań i analiz! Zdrowaj, bo mierze. To doskonały materiał badawczy! Wysyłamy próbki na Ziemię! Przeżyj kosmiczną przygodę z bohaterami Space Mission Misja w Kosmosie! Te i wiele innych zabawek znajdziesz w Kinder Niespodziance i na magickinder.com Okay, that's how it looks like, and I will show you how easy it is to set the stereo for one of the scenes. So this is, this is one of the scenes. I have my uh, camera selected and I want it to be the left camera. So I run the script and the objects were created. So here I have the far point and here I am looking through the camera. So I simply have to grab it and position it correctly until it covers everything. It's of course too far. I don't know how to be precise here, but anyway. Okay, something like that. And this is my near point, as simple as this. When I look at the last frame of this shot, I see that it's not the near point, so I need to move it a little bit closer to the camera. And that's it. Now I can hide this object select the far point and position it behind everything, behind everything that is visible, right? And that's it. The driver will take care about everything else. And now if I select my right camera and I look at those custom properties, 
So here I can decide how many pixels will be cropped, how many uh, pixels of the depth bracket I will have. I will now increase it substantially. Let's say I have set it to 15 pixels. Here is the X position of the right camera. So if I change it to something 60, for example, you see that it updates, right? As easy as this. Okay, some of the some of the tips. Just uh, yes, okay, no problem. This is not good because um, let's imagine that we would like this uh, monkey, this one, to be just a little bit in front of the screen. We have a problem because it's occluded, occluded by the edge of the screen. So the occlusion. This is a very strong depth cue. The occlusion will say that this monkey is behind the screen. But if we push it, if we pull it in front, the parallax will say that it's in front of the screen. And we have a confusion. And the feeling of disbelief will, uh, will be present. So this is better, right, in stereo. Now, another thing, something like this. The, the, here we have the situation that uh, one of the monkeys is very close to us and the other one is very far away. If we leave it this way, uh, we will have the effect of cardboarding. So we will perceive it as the layers distributed in space, not the objects that have volume. It's better to fill the space with something. So just add some objects and, and, and so on. Th this simply feels better. The other thing is something about the um, <clears throat> focal length. The wider lens we use, the more roundness we introduce to our objects. The longer the lens, the more cardboarding appears. So, those are the those are the, those are some just 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 some of the uh, rules that we can follow. Okay, now I have given you several equations, rules, graphs, uh, rules to follow, but stereoscopy is more about the feeling. So, the rules, of course, can be broken. The limits can be pushed as long as we know what we are doing. So let me just uh, finish this, let me summarize all this with the quote from Lenny Lipton. And it's something like this. In order for stereoscopic cinematography to be a creative medium, it's got to be intuitive. If it's not in the gut, it will, it's not going to succeed as an art form. If you have to rely solely on tables and calculations, Composing stereoscopic images is not going to work. Thank you very much for your attention, Bartek Skirita.